Welcome to another uh, podcast uh, by Laura's Guns and Money with uh, Scott R. Kaufman and Steve Adderwell. We are going to be talking about the first season uh, of a series we've, we've we've had a few conversations about Game of Thrones. So we're we're looping back in order to find something to do with ourselves until next February. Um, and I think we'll start actually, though, with with the end of the current season, where uh, there's a there's a scene, formerly nicely composed with 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 Davos, and Stannis and Melisandre, where Melisandre saves Davos's life, because she's realized that the Game of Thrones is sort of a con, it's not really important. Yeah, I know it's the title of the series, but it's only really the title of the first novel, and it really doesn't matter. And Melisandre recognizes this, finally, uh, right at the end of the season. And then they all stare off into the sunset, like the end of the fifth season of Mad Men. Um, but it's a, it's a good moment to, to, to loop us back to the beginning, because the series opens with a prologue. And it's, you can read what I've already written on it, and what Stephen's already written on it. Um, but it's a prologue that's utterly divorced in the novel, um, at least, from the main storylines that we get, you know, the Stark family. And it's, it's all about poor Will. And, yeah, and, and about warnings that don't get through. Yeah, that, are, that just aren't heeded. And it's, it's strange because uh, if you actually go back, you see the White Walker's face for um, literally three-tenths of a second. I think um, part of that has to do with the fact that they clearly I, weren't happy with the model work that they were doing. I think, I think it's partly that, but it's also sort of classic horror film technique. How do you show yeah. the monster? How do you make the monster scariest? You, you, you don't show him. But he, it, it, he's actually up on screen for three-tenths of a second, and um, I'll, I'll edit in the screenshot, the only one that took me like four hours of hitting Shift-S in, in mm -hmm. VLC player to actually capture but the human brain actually does register, you know, it's not subliminal messages in the way that they sort of work in Fight Club. Um, but it, it, it is sort of, it, it's there. You, you, your brain recognizes a presence, however fleeting it is. Mm -hmm. And it's very fleeting for the majority of the first season because that's yeah. sort of, that's it. Yeah, I mean, um, and, you know, what I, what I like about that is that, you know, you you do have this sense that there is this more important plot that you're not seeing. And what's interesting about the prologue, when you think about it, is the chain of dominoes it sets off that are almost written out of the narrative, right? In the beginning, we see uh, Sir Waymar Royce and Will and Jared go off to look for missing wildlings. And then they disappear. And then... Uh, Benjamin Stark goes, goes after them, looking for them, and then he disappears. And then Sir Jorah Mormont goes off looking for him and encounters something that he could not possibly have imagined. But still, even at that point, no one south of the wall yet knows until the raven gets to Stannis. And save for Stannis, no one believes that there is this larger plot going on. Um, one, one thing that I did want to mention about sort of interesting differences in this little prologue section between the, the book and the show is that, um, you know, and part of this is just a natural difference of medium issue, is that uh, the prologue in the book has this kind of, I want to say it's almost like uh, a short like uh, Tim O'Brien's story about Vietnam. Well, it's it like begins... the West Point officer and his two uh, far more experienced grunts going off into a recon mission. 
Yeah, and and the other thing is that the 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 novel begins in media race. You're they're already eight days out from the wall. Yeah. In the novel, in in the series, in part because they needed to establish what the wall was. Yeah, they have that transition. Yeah, I'm they begin it right now actually. Yeah, they they begin with the wall, and that's a sort of crucial difference because in the novel you're you're literally thrust into the middle of it, um, as in media race suggests, and. You, you have to figure out the sort of social structure, you know, what kind of people are these, and so you're right, the, you, you're, you're already mapping it on to sort of the, the Tim O'Brien military short story. Um, I, but you, I also, sort of... you also get a lot about how social classes, and uh, I mentioned this in, in my piece on the prologue, and maybe we can throw a link uh, up or something. You learn a lot about the functioning of the Night's Watch as an institution just from these three characters. Uh, that, yeah. you know, Sir Waymar Royce, who, you know, even in the show, you can tell he's much better dressed and equipped. He's He speaks differently. He's clearly of a different social class. Is in charge despite being the most junior of the three men. And in, that, in the novel, that's perfectly clear because of the way that he talks about um, who who breastfeeds you. which yeah, which and, and, and that's not something you think would, would become really an issue in the series, breastfeeding. Yeah. But it really does when you think about what happened. Yeah, and it's area. it's also um, you know in part because of the the point of view, you know the will goes into a lot of description about how uh, the the young knight is wearing is using the wrong kind of gear. Yeah. That, that he draws his sword when what you really want is a dagger because the trees are too close together to really let you use a sword effectively. He's using a very fancy horse when what you want is a hardier, more common horse. Um, and throughout this, the scene in the, in, the, in the books, you have uh, Sir Waymar clearly out of his depth and kind of reacting to it by antagonizing his men, almost to the point of fragging. Uh, you know, Jared, uh, the, the guy with the beard, um, almost like draws a sword on him and kills him. But at the same time, his kind of the uh, ingrained sense of class prevents him. At the end of the day, he knows that Sir Waymar Royce is a knight, um, and that you know he himself is not. And class trumps military order, which is, I think, a sort of significant. Yeah. Even in even in, in in Will's mind, you know, class yeah. trumps military experience. And, um, and in an institution that's supposed to be a brotherhood. Yeah. Right, the the men of the Night's Watch are theoretically supposed to be equal, save for their actual military hierarchy, and yet here we have a young man who's basically bounced way ahead of more experienced men because of his birth. It's a broken military institution. Yeah, essentially, and we're that's what we're introduced to is that this broken mil military institution is the one thing that stands between all of these characters that we're going to be introduced to and creeping death. Um, yeah, cold creeping death. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's really significant that that this is our introduction to both the the novel and the and the series, and um, in particular the series because if you don't grab people in the first five minutes, um, you're you're going to lose them. Uh, yeah, and, and I think this is why it's it's interesting that this prologue scene was a reshoot. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. Yeah, the the DVD commentary, especially on this episode, is really interesting. That they basically said, like, in, in the original version that they shot, it started with Bran writing out to do the execution. And they felt that it was too slow and talky, so that they, this part got added back in, um, <laughs> in order to kind of give an immediate punch. Um, it's interesting the, in terms yeah. of... You know, they they went back to fidelity to the text. Yeah, that 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 is, that is really interesting. I I don't know how I missed that on the DVD commentaries. Um, I've only taught this like eleven times now. Uh, but yeah, that's that's really interesting that, that that's a reshoot because I, I I could see what the what the what they would have been thinking by trying to differentiate themselves a bit from the novel. Um, anticipating mm -hmm. that their audience would would know that it was going to be Will's story first, and then throwing them a curve. But uh, I'm sort of 
glad that they went with the <laughs> went with fidelity to the text because it starting off with Bran writing out would have made sort of no sense. Although, actually, yeah. I take it back. Beginning with a beheading and having a child watch a beheading, that's there's a there's yeah. a factor there. It it would have been interesting. It would have been very different. I mean, the the curious thing is that the scene with Bran and the beheading is actually the first bit that was ever written of Game of Thrones. Uh, when, when George R. R. Martin first had the idea, he had this idea of a child riding out to witness an execution. And he seems to have liked that idea of children witnessing executions, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's a, well, we could, we could sort of, the one thing that, that, keeping the prologue and, and attaching it to Will really um, really works because we have a lot of sympathy for Will. He's a man who's running away from certain death to certain death. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's an interesting difference from the book because in, in the Will. book, it's, it's Jared who runs off, and yeah. Will actually does something incredibly brave and clever in his own way. He he runs up a tree, and Sir Waymar actually gets this moment of kind of lunatic bravery, in which he actually goes sword to sword with one of the other. And I think they changed that in part because they just didn't want to show that sword fight, um, because it would have re involved showing the monster way too much. Yeah. Um, but what he does is, after Sir Waymar Royce is dead, he goes down to grab what's left of his sword to show... There is clearly Matt, like, he, he's still a member of the Night's Watch. He's saying, okay, I need to explain to the Night's Watch what we're facing. And the best way I can do that is by showing them a sword of castle forged steel that's been shattered like ice. Yeah. This is magic at work. They'll believe this. And then he dies in the execution of his duty. And it's Jared, the most experienced of the three men, you know, the, the hardest uh, grunt soldier there is who, like, chickens out, runs off, and then dies a, uh, uh, a deserter. So I think I, it's an interesting little inversion. Yeah, I, I certainly think so, because, you know, in, in the series, we're introduced to Ned Stark as a man who is killing a very sympathetic character. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the, in the novel, it's just about his responsibility, and this is what a good lord does, and... But in the series, it's hey asshole, don't don't Hello? don't behead him. Yeah, can you hear me? Sorry, you cut out for like half a second there. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of a uh, interference. Um, uh, that uh, we we've been having technical difficulties at my apartment with the internet, so uh, I'll edit this out. No, no, I won't. But um, thank you for bearing with us, people. Okay, uh, continue. Sorry. Well, you were talking about you know we're introduced to Eddard Stark executing. Oh. A sympathetic figure. Yes, and and that makes him look like an asshole, and that's a great way to introduce a character who is going to be, in fact, the most sympathetic figure. Um, as he becomes the hand, and and we're sort of moving to what you wanted to talk about. Um, in terms of those politics, um, what it means to be the hand, whether it's better to be effective or liked, um, and. And this is, I think, where I should turn it over to you, because I think you have... Sure. I mean, the big political question of this episode is, is Eddard Stark going to become the Hand of the King, and what does that mean? Um, and we get different perspectives on it. And, you know, the there's stuff that I really... Uh, I, certain adaptational changes that I think some of the fans have, have had problems with, it, namely that Catelyn Stark takes a diametrically opposed... <laughs> yeah position than she does in the books, where in the book she's acting very much as, you know, what we would, you know, us moderns call a politician's wife. She says to him very forthrightly, you can't refuse the king this. It's too important. He'll see you as, you know, unfriendly, and that's not a good thing. You have to do this. And then when the letter comes to from Lysa Aaron, she says, well, now you absolutely have to go. You have to, uh, you know, find out who killed John Aaron. You have to stop the Lannisters. The king is in danger. Uh, and this gives 
this gives Catelyn a much stronger grounding for this like sense of guilt that we see, you know, well into the third season because at the end of the day, she is the one who urged her husband to go. Um and losing that did hurt the character. I mean, props to Michelle Fairley. She she was an amazing Catelyn, but it was not the same Catelyn from the books. The the what I, <coughs> was. I will say that they, sorry. Yeah. What I will um. say they they got right is that Robert is an absentee king, and he really sees the hand of the king as the person who's going to do his job. What's interesting is that Ned never really seems to understand that's what he's about. He sees his role to be Robert's friend. And well, he, he seems, my, my long-term argument is that that's what gets him killed, not honor. Uh Okay, I'd like to hear that sort of play it out at more length, and I guess we will sure. over the next I mean, couple of episodes. When we go later into the yeah. seasons, yeah. Um, because I think I think that the change um, in 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 Catelyn's character is is not really for her sake; it's more to establish uh, the injustice that she's doing to John, uh, John Snow. I think that's why they changed the the circumstances of Ned's leaving. Because in the series, it's clearly she doesn't want to leave because the last time she, you know, Ned went off with Robert, he came back with Jon Snow. Right. And it, it's sort of your very, not typical, but um, understandable domestic affair. But it, it makes Jon Snow seem all the more the victim. Yeah. And I think the, the change was more designed for that than it was to alter her character. Because Snow is obviously going to become increasingly important as a member of the Night's Watch, and we're already sort of getting that the Night's Watch is going to be important from the prologue, and then he's going to be off to them, and and so they need yeah. to establish his character very quickly. Yeah, and you know the um, I mean, all all I'll just say is I think that had unintended consequences. Yeah. Um, and you know, in terms of of Jon Snow, I mean, I think part of the danger is that if you lean too on the the whoopee button, that he does become a little bit of a caricature of like an emo teenager. Um, <laughs> and you well, know, there's no spoilers here. We can we can we can go all the way up through season yeah. three where he is an emo teenager. Yeah, I and mean, you know, I'll have to say, like in terms of adaptation, uh, you know, no no offense to to Kit Harrington, but I do feel like He's been one of the more off and on elements of that adaptation. That the Jon Snow you get in the books is not as unrelentingly emo. Uh, he he does have his moments, and certainly it's kind of interesting. In this pilot, you'll see uh, Jon Snow as less emo than he is in the books like in the in the books he actually like is in the the feast hall and runs out crying which i just thought to be like one of those moments where it's just like they couldn't have done this it would have just been too ridiculous to actually yeah. show this um well but, but he's being he's being sort of unnaturally unwavering in in the pilot because he's trying to put on a strong face for bran and yeah. it's it, that, that that's sort of you know, made clear that he's, yeah. he's, this is all an act for him. Um, not so much Rob, Rob and, and Theon, both at, at, at the scene of the execution, they, they had these uh, medium close-ups and close-ups of them. And, and both of them are, you know, doing their, they're sort of staring. And then Theon is like staring at the execution. I will watch this. I will not turn away. And then he's like, squirrel. <laughs> And he's well, just looking in some and, other direction entirely. Yeah, and he's he's smiling. And uh, the the one thing I wanted to check is, does he actually do the bit where he kicks the head? No, not in the series. Ah, because I was gonna say the the nice thing there's a a quick little beat with um with Rob where he just kind of he's clenching his jaw and you can see him sort of swallow down vomit, um which you know I kind of like it's just a and he's standing a little bit away. Um, yeah, it's 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 Theon is over one, Rob is in another place, and then you have Bran and John together. 
Yeah, and that, you know, in a sense, Rob is also being observed. You know, he's he's the heir apparent, and he has to, yeah. you know, he's been through this process that Bran's entering, and he has to kind of, uh, you know, uh, show his chops. Um, whereas, you know, John is a little bit freer because he's a bastard to kind of play this you know, nurturing role because he's not under observation in the same way. Well, not in the same way. And this this, this goes to back to what we were saying about Catelyn. In, in the scene immediately before this when, when they're shooting the arrows and there's this moment at the end where John he's actually cleaning up after his brother. He's picking up the arrows, he's being a good and he is being observed because Catelyn is giving him, you mm -hmm. know, an the evil fucking eye, eye yeah. from, from high above and it's this you know, we go from the low angle on Catelyn to the high angle on John. The power relations are very clear. And then um, we get the sense that John is the best older brother ever, even if he's not legitimate. So he's yeah. sort of set up as this nurturing, like nothing bad is going to happen to Bran so long as John is there. Yeah. So and, of course, and in the it's, first, yeah, it's, yeah. And it's carried through with, with Arya as well. Yeah. That, um, Rob, when he's discussed by his his siblings later in the series, is the the child to look up to. Yeah. Um, and he is, uh, you know, he he's uh, you can also see that he's kind of like the deputized underparent. You know, when when Ari is kicking up a fuss, he's the one who, uh, you know, he's the one who has to take her off to bed. It's it's John who can be the slightly subversive figure and kind of be a bit of an emotional buffer. Um, He's their best friend. Yeah. On the and, and on the other hand, um, what what you don't get as much, you know, uh, is this kind of interesting quasi rivalry between him and John that's in the books, where the two of them, uh, you know, immediately disagree about the the takeaway from the. From the execution, one of them saying that we'll, that the executed man was brave, the other one saying he's scared, and they go off and have a, a horse race, which is where they actually discover the the dead deer. And I'm looking at it right now, uh, and it is pretty disgusting. Yes, we can actually see you looking at it in your glasses. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't even have to edit this in later. It's it's the scene is right there in, in your glasses. Yeah. Um, yeah, when they find the dead deer, and then, of course, the most important moment in the series, puppies. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it, it is an important little scene for, and it's one of the things that, like, they both kept from the, the original version and then added bits in, and you can sort of tell because there's moments at which it's raining and then moments at which it's not raining. <laughs> um, but, you know, you get some important little things like Theon has... A resentment complex. He's also a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a sadist in terms of wanting to kill puppies. So, like that's his initial reaction. Uh, John's, uh, John is kind of playing the uh, self-effacing, uh, you know, again the buffer. Rob is acting as kind of the more forthright protector, um, and Eddard is playing the kind of grumpy dad who's like. You know, God damn it! I'm not gonna walk him at three o'clock in the morning. So you know, but it's the northern version. So you know, if it dies, you bury it. That <laughs> was like, God, you know, Ned is just really grim sometimes. But it's also it's it's a it's a moment where where Jon Snow is is acknowledged as being, yeah, part of the family, and it's but a really important time, acknowledgement. At the same time, a bastard, and that's what I kind of like is that, like, as introductions to characters go, these two scenes are really good about sketching out who's who, what their relationships are, um, you know, and to that extent, I'm kind of surprised that, like, some people had trouble remembering who who Rob was and who Theon was, because Theon, you know, is, like, said to his face, you're not a Stark. Um, well, I, I will. I will say that even even in class, when I'm when I was teaching this, and I had the giant screenshot up on up on the wall of of Rob, John, and Theon looking at Bran uh, while he was shooting the arrow, I got him wrong. 
Like, I mean, even just the, sort of, I was glancing back and I was like, oh yeah, oh wait, big. So what John says and my entire class is looking at me like, yeah, it's not what, uh, that's not John, that's Rob. Have you even seen this thing, you <laughs> motherfucker? You teach yeah. it? And it gets more um, confusing when they actually shave uh, yeah. the main cast because we're so used to like, these are very these are variations of men with beards, uh, and then they cease to be men with beards. Yeah, they're <laughs> oh, all those beards. Um, yeah, that would be a completely different series. Uh, but yeah. yeah. So in terms of adaptations that don't work, I have to say I think the scene between Cersei and Jaime is probably the clunkiest in this episode, in the sense of who goes up to someone and says. As your brother, I must tell you that, you know, you are worrying too much about the death of John Aaron, Hand of the King. Uh, well, I mean, I thought that was supposed to be performance. I mean, for to sort of see that their relationship is unnatural and awkward, and whenever they interact with a possibility of someone overhearing, they, they, they do tend to be overly formal. Well, he, except that the only people who could possibly overhear them at this moment are an order of monks, uh, excuse me, of, of nuns sworn to lifelong vows of silence. Yeah, so but... it is, you know, and they're up on a balcony and they're not talking very loud. And it's just that, that line particularly, not the rest of it, but that line particularly, like just kind of like that's, that's screenwriting and that's not actual discourse. I, I don't know. says, don't... as your brother, I blank. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I've said as your brother quite a few times in my lifetime to my younger siblings, um, it, involving weddings too. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I sort of see that formality between them, even in private, it, it, it pops up again at the end of season three. Like, hey, mm. I'm home. Yeah, and the fact yeah. that they're careful to, to not be touching in this scene is kind of interesting. Um Although, you know, reflective of a, of a caution that they don't actually have yeah. <laughs> uh, in the books. Like, you know, for, for two people carrying on not merely uh, an affair, but one that is criminal, blasphemous under their religion, and treasonous, you'd think that they would be a little bit more circumspect when, you know, the reality is everyone at court knows pretty much except for for Robert himself um, you think they would be but the other thing is that they're they're not that bright um, yeah see I mean Cersei becomes brighter once Jamie leaves but I, I think before before Jamie's gone she's she's just sort of going along with what feels good and isn't quite as she's she's more of the wronged woman yeah, um, and that's one of the kind of the stranger little opening like questions in the series is what the hell she was doing when John Aaron was alive. Cuz there's never any evidence that she was planning to make a move against him. Um despite the fact that he pretty much had her life in his hands, which is just kind of astonishing to me as a as a matter of, you know, self uh self-preservation. I think she's not worried about self-preservation at this point because she's a Lannister. Um, I think she's just relying on her mm. connections and the fact that, you know, the Kingslayer will be there whenever she needs him to be. That's why I'm saying that, that it's not until Jamie's absence that she right. really kind of comes into her own in the series. Obviously, it's different in the novels, but yeah. um, in the series, that, that, you know, she's Linus... He's her security blanket. Right. Um, so let me see. What do we want to do next? Uh, I kind of want to talk about Drogo and uh, the, the Daenerys sections. Okay. Uh, just because, I mean, I, I love the, the work that was done with um, uh, Amelia Clark and uh, um, what's the name of the guy who played Viserys? I'm blanking on his name. Oh, I, um, tall, whiny bitch. I think we can just go with that. Okay, well, he's a great British actor. Anyway, I thought they were great together. We immediately get this, like, really creepy 
you know, Stockholm Syndrome vibe off of them. And, you know, that's almost perfect from the books. If I had um, a complaint to make about when Drogo shows up, that Martin does something really interesting in the books in which he shows the Dothraki to be a very complicated people because Drogo owns a house in Pentos, this enormous mansion that has been given to him essentially so that he won't attack Pentos. And he initially shows up in these flowing silks that have been offered to him because the the Dothraki have this kind of interesting multicultural bent to them, that they know how to act in cities and that they can sort of do that cultural shift. And then when they go out of the cities back to the Dothraki plain, that's when they put back on the clothes that they have uh, here in this scene where Drogo shows up and they they revert back to their own cultural ways and it's a it's a fascinating kind of show of a, of a of a culturally literate people um who have these different sides to them that just doesn't show up in the show and you know the wedding scene especially gets really criticized uh oh, wow. for for all kinds of stuff um <laughs> and yeah. and and rightly so yeah um, I'm I'm actually I'm looking at the IMDb page. Does Drago doesn't even show up on it? He is in the first episode, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm looking at it right now. Uh, yeah. he meets Danny, and then the wedding yeah, the, is like right, you know, like at minute fifty. Yeah, it, it's I mean because I I know we have the creepy scene with um, and his name is Harry Lloyd. Uh, yes. As he was really said. good in uh, Doctor Who. Oh, Jesus, he was in Doctor Who? Mm-hmm. I should know that. Who was he in Doctor uh, Who? Do you remember the episode with the uh, where Doctor Who like loses his memory and is a teacher at an English public school? No, you're thinking of... Wait. He was no. one of the like three creepy space aliens... Oh, uh, holy crap, who, yeah. He, he yeah. had black hair at the time. And, Jesus, that's the exact same episode in which, um, what's his name? Uh, little frog person. Green Jojen. Dreamer. Jojen. Jojen is in. Yeah, and, and there's an episode this season in which Ed Muir and Davos are Russian sub-captains. Yeah, so, I, I, and it's like this... I, I, we've come to my, my wife and I have come to the conclusion that there are only so many actors in Britain at any given point in time. Yeah. We were watching uh, the British series *Accused*, in which we recognized absolutely everyone, including Sean yeah, well, Bean I... in an incredible performance as a transvestite. And if you, oh if, yes, yes, yeah, it's it, it, good. It's absolutely brilliant. And yeah. and anti spoiler, he doesn't die. It's amazing. Wow. He lived through the whole fucking episode. We kept waiting. Because... So clearly Sean Bean is like drag for him is some sort of immortality. Yeah. You know, some people just they just got it. They yeah. Got I mean it. the so getting back anyway, to the yeah, getting for, back to... for just a second. I mean the the freak dancing is a problem. The murder less so. I mean that's that's part of Dothraki culture that they 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 are a warrior culture and they like to fight each other. The multi-varied ethnicity is more of a problem, although, you know, one of the things that does kind of come to mind is that the Dothraki view of slavery is a little bit... Basically, they, they have a um, patrilineal descent, so any child of a Dothraki man is a Dothraki. And since they're capturing slaves from many different ethnicities, you'd expect a certain amount of, of ethnic variation. But Absolutely. it is like they really took a casting call from, like, any rando non-white dude. Um, in, in I think they were filming this in Malta. Yeah, I, I, I actually sort of... I like that. And I, I, I've had students who've written about the, the sort of proto-democratic nature of the Dothraki in that you cannot, <laughs> you cannot become 
a Lannister. You cannot become a Stark. There, there are these very anti-American ideas about bloodlines in in Westeros. But in Essos, you can become a Dothraki. Well, you can um, become a Dothraki if you are sold to the Dothraki, and or you know your your mother was was raped by a Dothraki. So, you know. I said proto. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, speaking of which, I mean, you know, I will actually go to bat in in defense of uh, the change to the the betting uh, because in the books you have this rather weird arc in which. Drogo takes the time to actually get Daenerys' consent at the wedding yeah. and then completely reverts to marital rape uh, until Danny can actually, you know, until she essentially assimilates into Dothraki culture and can approach him as an equal or a near equal anyway. And I always thought that there was something weird to that arc that that someone who, you know, clearly at least initially decides that it's worth the effort to achieve consent becomes a sort of a monolithic rapist uh, and then switches back. I think a, a, the show gave us a more... A well, more yeah, in the show, arc. he just rapes her and then she becomes, again, Stockholm Syndrome, right? She's right. she sort of transferred from her brother to her her husband, as as a woman to be abused. Um, the fact that he comes to accept, you know, the, well, her her humanity uh, is, I guess, uh, uh, a good a good thing. Like it's it's great that you accept that the woman that you've been raping has feelings, um, but it's equally disturbing in both. In both yeah. cases, um, and and the change, I think, is just made to make Danny more sympathetic from the get go. Um, yeah, and I think, but it's also I think it's something where by showing a kind of a rising action, the fact that she actually does come to care for him is made a little bit closer to modern you know sensibilities in that she's able to sort of make a horrible relationship stop being horrible. And... Ooh, I don't... Uh, I don't know. I mean... I don't know. Maybe I'm just watching too many episodes of SVU, but uh, <laughs> you, you don't fall... Well, okay, well, actually. No, but probably, by the you end do of fall it, in I love mean, with your rapist, yeah. Um, you know, by, by the end of the season, when, you know, he's her, uh, you know, sun and stars, and she's his moon of his life, or whichever way it goes, you know, and certainly by the time that he reappears in season two, you know, lots of people found that you know, you know, a great little uh, a great little cameo. Uh, so you know, I would argue that they actually did manage somehow to pull that off. Yeah, I, I, I can't see that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's just one of those. It's one of those differences that that my students always sort of fixated on. Because it's such a it's such a big difference consent versus non consent yeah. and and they've all you know they're they're all freshmen they've all been through the freshman orientation and 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 that that discussion is a big part of it and um and changing it in a way that makes a drago seem worse. Although I guess maybe it doesn't make them. I don't. I Does don't know it make it worse. I mean, that's, yeah. that's always been the the question for me. Is like, is it worse that someone manages to get consent initially and then decides, well, now that we're married, I no longer have to worry about this, so I will just brutalize you twenty four seven. I, is that better? Ah, uh, yeah. I think I think we're talking about degrees of horribleness. Yeah. Um, uh, should we should we move on? Yeah, probably, because I don't think we're going to answer this question. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me see. Some other... What else should we talk about? Uh, I, I do love the, the bit... Uh, the King's Entrance into Winterfell is just a wonderful uh, you know, bit from beginning to end, with the, the sole exception of the fact that, that Bran climbing around the, the rooftops of Winterfell does not in any way look realistic. Yeah, there's some really bad CGI in the opening 
episode. Yeah, uh, but you know the you really get a wonderful sense, you know, with the the riders coming in and Arya on top of the cart with the helmet on, um, you know, and even even little things like uh, you know Sansa's shrug when she's asked where her sister is. Or the way that Arya like pushes Bran around, like you really get a sense of the family dynamics. Um, I mean, it, it, it's funny because they they actually work very well together as an ensemble cast, and they're going to be an ensemble cast for approximately the next half an hour. Yeah, and yeah. and that's what kind of makes this feel very different on a rewatch. Is that oh, it's bittersweet. Kind of, oh, it's really bittersweet and nostalgic in the sense that like this is really kind of the last moment that everyone's going to be happy for a given value of happy. And it's, well, for a given value, for, for I think, most conventional values. Um, it's the last time John's going to see any of them Yeah. until, and, until he notices Bran's dire wolf at the end of season three. Yeah. It's the first I mean, contact he's going to have. There are, you know, minor elements of unhappiness, like John is in a kind of a crappy position. Uh, Arya is clearly unhappy about having to sew versus getting to shoot a bow. Uh, but, you know, they are a working family. Um, and then the Lannisters come in, and you, know, you get some really funny little bits, like, uh, you know, the way in which uh, the Hound's helmet keeps bouncing as the horse bounces. <laughs> like, Sansa's look to J Joffrey where he kind of does this, like, throwish, like, yeah, what up? Um, mm. And Rob kind of goes instant, like, overprotective older brother. Uh, you know, I just, I love that. Oh, and, and yeah. the bit where uh, where, where um, uh, Jamie takes his helmet off, but I swear to God, they ripped straight out of Shrek. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've seen Shrek in about a decade, so I, I don't remember, but... It's, it's um... the helmet off, hair toss back kind of thing. Yeah, I can, I, I'm not remembering, but, uh, yeah. And also we get, we get Tyrion's greatest line, which I'm, I'm trying to find the quote of, and I, I can't. Um, Tyrion and Jon's conversation is one of the, oh, yes. Peter Dinklage's, like, the bit that, uh, you know, all, all dwarves, wait, uh, never all forget all, what you want. Which yeah, the, the never forget what you are, you know, make it yeah, use it use it as an armor. Um, but also the yeah, all I mean, dwarves are bastards in their father's eyes. Uh, yeah, is the other one. The kind of the interesting thing about that the the line about never forget what you are, you know, make it armor, is in a certain sense he's lying. Like once you get inside Tyrion's point of view, he never forgets that you know, his disability makes him a figure of mockery. And he's constantly thinking about his own disability in, you know, ways that show a, a sense of humiliation. Um, well, but you know, I mean, so that, in a sense, that's he's sort of what he's saying. convince himself. Yeah, but he's saying, you know, make, make it an armor. Um, yeah, the, the that, that's is, a process. He hasn't, he hasn't succeeded in that. He, He's clearly pretending to, to more success uh, than, you know, than he's actually achieved. Well, he, he does also slap Joffrey around in this episode, so, you know. Yes, I mean, he's, th there's clearly that. And I, I would say that there's an interesting shift with Peter Dinklage in the role of Tyrion, because the first Tyrion chapter that you get in the, in the books is Tyrion sitting up reading. And that's important for the to engage the sympathies of readers. But it's also, it's a more nerdy Tyrion than the one we get in the show where he's introduced, you know, mid-orgasm and beer swallow. Um, yeah, but... You know, the Tyrion in the show is more is more confident about who he is. He, cer he certainly is. He's, he's, he's certainly more acclimated to the lifestyle that he lives in the show and we don't get the kind of insecurities we get in the novel. But the other thing about him in the novel is, is when they're, they're setting him up, they're, they're setting, they're setting, laying the groundwork for, for Jon Snow and Sam, right? By, yeah. by having Tyrion be a reader there, that's what's going to create the connection between Jon and Sam. And we have to have some sort of bridge to that. Otherwise yeah. it's just, 
you know, why would Jon Snow come to the defense of... Yeah, and he, he has to get that lesson first from... And I, I did like the change of giving the lesson about Jon Snow's privilege to Tyrion instead of to Donald Noy, because it just... Yeah. It works as simplification. It works in terms of, like, it's a consistent viewpoint that the character would have. Uh, you know, and it furthers the relationship between Tyrion and Jon, which is a kind of a strange little subplot in the first book. Like, they do spend some time together and get to know each other, and then don't see each other again for five books. Yeah, it's a... Uh, no, no spoilers there, but, uh, yeah... It, it's going to be a while for a lot of these characters before, and this this is why this episode yeah. is so bittersweet upon rewatching. Is that, you know, th this is this is it. I mean, John and Rob, who who look so alike at times that I confuse them in front of rooms yeah. full of people. You know, they're this is it for them. Yeah, they're um, never going to see each other again. And it it's. It's that John and Arya, you know. Um, well, I guess Winterfell basically, itself. Yeah, it. This is John. It, and uh, it, sorry, Brandon his legs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, but I mean, this it, it. It's really odd that they they're beginning with with the end. Um, they're sort of, you know, they're. they're you know, you brought up Star Wars a couple weeks ago, um, and now every time I rewatch it, I'm I'm seeing not really Star Wars. I'm seeing The Empire Strikes Back in these sort of wistful, you know, but dark moments in mm. that in that film. Um, tonally, they seem so kind of on par. Like this is this is the extra extended medieval version of The Empire Strikes Back. Mm, interesting. Conflicts between parents and children, brothers and sisters. Good guys not losing. Not brothers and sisters. Yeah, it's yeah, guys losing hands. Eh, yeah, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. There's, there's just... <laughs> but but I'm, I'm more interested sort of in, in the tone, which is, you know, it's, it's the reason Empire is really the only good Star Wars film in terms of actual filmmaking and... Mm -hmm. and writing is, is is because it it deals with the consequences of these outwardly heroic actions and these kind of like grand gestures um but it's also much more involved in sort of the machinations of empire and yeah. that's what we're getting here but of course it's all it's, it's all con because the machinations of empire don't actually matter yeah um the, in the in the big bigger scheme of it. yeah in the bigger scheme of it although you know they are important in the sense that they are the distraction that prevents the realm from dealing with a real threat. That, you know, uh, Eddard, who at one moment actually talks to to his brother Benjen about, like, what's going on north of the wall. And in the books, you know, you know that he, you find out that he's, like, that Eddard knows about Mance Raider, that he's worried that he's going to have to deal with this at some point in the future. And that he's just not on the scene when the news comes down about, uh, you know, uh, Benjen disappearing and uh, uh, J.R. Mormont being attacked, that things would be very, very different if Eddard Stark had, had uh, stayed in Winterfell and been on scene in the North to deal, deal with things. So, uh, just one other thing I kind of, in terms of adaptation that I wanted to bring up, is the scene in the crypts between uh, Eddard and um, and Robert? You know, one thing that is lost, I feel, between the show and the the book is Eddard's internal monologue. And the Eddard of the internal monologue is a different kind of person than than his his outward appearance. He's someone who's more, I want to say, damaged than he appears. Uh, you know, I mean, as, while he's in this tomb, he's having flashbacks to the death of his sister. You know, flashbacks that will recur throughout the the novel. And yeah. that's actually a plot line that the show has almost completely excised. And I'm, I'm really curious about how they're going to get that routed back, uh, you know, and, and what, you know, in terms of what vehicle they're going to use to do that. Um, 
But it's also like in terms of my my long term argument about you know Eddard's honor wasn't what got him killed; it was his sense of what his job was. You know, the Eddard in his own thoughts is a lot smarter than he's given credit for. You know, he knows that Pycelle is a Lannister spy. He knows that you know Littlefinger can't be trusted as far as he can be thrown. He knows that he's entered into a political world that is dangerous and that he's not suited out for. It. So it's more in a sense that he's like he's committing himself to something he knows to be dangerous and he knows that he's not suited for because he's he sees himself as Robert's friend. Um, as opposed to someone who's just going down there and thinking that honor will win out. That in a certain sense he's signed himself up even knowing that he could be defeated, that he's likely to lose. Yeah, um, the series plays it much more like, you know, a samurai film in which, yeah. which Ned Stark is, is your typical Kurosawa character. Well, in half of, in, in the half of the Kurosawa films where he's not a bumbling idiot, um, the, the Kurosawa figure who is, who is honor above all and, yeah. We we know that character, and and he doesn't need that much introduction. Um, but I also I think we have to credit Sean Bean with with actually giving us a sense of that interiority that is in the novel, just in his silences. And there sure. are a lot of there are a lot of shots, um, reverse shots when things happen, where it's just a reverse shot to Sean Bean looking at it, like. And see, I I do a terrible job there. I try to impersonate him looking mm -hmm. at it. Um, it's it's actually he's he's quite good at 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 making the world seem like a like a terrible place that he just happens to live in yeah and, and especially you know i think you do get a sense in, in the scenes in which he's at the small council that this is a man who desperately wants to be anywhere but here yeah um i guess what you don't get as much is is the extent to which he's understanding what's going on around him yeah, and, and they sort of emphasize that by, you know, later, and we'll talk about this in later episodes, but as he finds the the sort of proof of, of Joffrey's birth, you know, they emphasize his sort of the, the Sean Bean detective agency aspect yeah. of the... And, you know... Ned Stark is more uh, hero. Yeah. Um, he's not someone who is coping with circumstances he understands. He's someone who's discovering the truth over a period of time. Um, by doggedly and with honor. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, Raymond Chandler-esque, right? Yeah, the, you know, the uh, a man must walk down those streets, a man who is who is not corrupt or afraid. Yeah. You know, the night and yeah, it's all of that. But you know, it's done well, and 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 I still, you know, when I when I reshow that that scene of Ned's execution in class. Oh yeah. I still get gasps. Um, oh yeah, no, and people and who just you know that, that's the, the proof of the pudding that right there. Like if yeah, you know if the reaction is is shock and horror instead of like oh you dummy, then you know they've done their job. Well, there's part of you dipshit in there. Like you trusted Joffrey. Well, he, he than you could trust. Probably. He didn't trust Joffrey. Well, yeah. He trusted uh, Littlefinger. He trusted Cersei. Yeah. Uh, he trusted Varys, but, you know. And that's Joffrey's big moment, but we'll get to that, because we're only in episode one, and we, we don't know what happens next. Yeah. Um, uh, so is there anything else you wanted to cover for this episode? Uh, no, I'm, I'm pretty good. Which is, which is strange, because before the podcast, we're like, we could go on for hours, and I think we both could, um, but we need to make this about 45, 50 minutes long, yeah. or YouTube <laughs> and the server won't accept it. Um, however, uh, there will be links in the post to what Stephen and I have already written about this section. Um, we've alluded to it uh, quite a bit already. Um, and we will be back next week for uh, episode two. Um, I can't wait to watch it for the first time ever. Um, really? Now, yeah. I, I, I don't know how to make it exciting. It, it's weird. It's like we're going back. And... Well, I mean, you know, episode two is perhaps not the most exciting of the... 
No, the first four episodes are, or after the first episode, the next the three second, are sort of the second, second, second third, third, and fourth. fourth. Yeah, are are yeah. a bit. You gotta you gotta learn the the cast. Yeah, um, but you know, but, interesting things happen nonetheless. And we will be covering them. So, uh, yeah. so long for now, and we will talk to you next week. Okay.